Welcome to Emerging Franchise Brands, the podcast that introduces you to the visionary founders of America's fastest growing franchise opportunities. We'll also hear from industry pros as they share insights on what it really takes to achieve the elusive milestone of 100 plus locations. I am your host, Frank Fumi, founder of i9 Sports, and my 20 year journey from inception to acquisition has given me a unique perspective on how to succeed in franchising. Join me as we welcome today's guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. On today's show, I have the co-founder and president of Woofies, Amy Addington. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. So, uh, Woofies, what a great name. Uh, <laughs> please, share, please share with us what Woofies is and uh, how the whole thing started. Sure. So Woofies is a pet sitting, dog walking, and mobile grooming company. Uh, we actually started in September 2004, so we're coming up on our 20-year anniversary, Congrats. which we're very excited about. Um, and I started Woofies with my neighbor at the time, Leslie Barron. Uh, we lived across the street from each other. Uh, we saw just a real need for a professional pet sitting company. And that's how we started first, was just offering a pet sitting dog walking and several years later, after building up our client base and our team of sitters, we had so many clients asking about mobile grooming and nobody was really doing it. So we just knew there was a great opportunity. So we bootstrapped our first van and started mobile grooming. Wow. Okay. And you've added so many more services, obviously, since you franchised. We're going to get into that in a second. So I would just, I would imagine this probably folks thinking right off the bat, thinking, okay, you're doing the the pet sitting and we've got mobile uh a mobile pet spa right and yeah. where where we get involved in in trying to expand this and and franchising how how did you even come to even think about maybe even franchising this concept because there's so many local kind of businesses that right. we do this absolutely um I actually started looking at franchising back in 2015. I went to my first IFB conference in New York nice. and started networking and meeting other franchisors and just learning about it because at the time we were really exploring what was the best growth strategy for Whoopies because we had, especially being in the Metro DC area, very transient. We have a lot of government, a lot of people moving away. We had so many clients that would move out of the area, call us and say, I need a Woofies, we need a Woofies. And so, you know, we had to really make that decision. Do we remain in Ashburn, which is where we started mm -hmm. and just have a really fantastic local business? Um, do we have some corporate owned locations or do we franchise? And the more I learned about franchising, I really fell in love with the concept of it because I think especially for our brand, with taking care of people's pets, going into their homes. It's a very personal business yes. and anyone who's a pet owner can relate to that. Our pets are our babies. And, uh, and, and I wanted someone who owned the business. I wanted somebody that was opening up our rest in Virginia location who owned a business, had that financial, that emotional investment in the company, because that's what I think is so needed for this type of business. It is not transactional. It is, such a relationship-based business. So the more we learned about franchising, we just felt like that was the right strategy for us. Yeah. And, you know, the pet business is so similar to the child-related businesses that as parents, we'll always spend more money on our pets and our kids than we ever will ourselves. It, it is a Seniors, pets, and kids. I mean, those are the three just very special groups. A absolutely. And no matter what the economy is, really from a recession resistance, aspect of, of investing in a, in a business, uh, a, a business involved with obviously pets or kids or seniors is going to be able to hang in there. Yeah. I mean, we've definitely proven the model over the years to be recession resistant. And then in 2020, we unfortunately had to add the label of pandemic resistant. <laughs> um, that's what I had in mind when we started franchising. Um, obviously life happens and um, that was certainly the biggest business challenge and the toughest business climate that we could have imagined. So as a young franchisor, and then also at the time owning a corporate location of a hundred plus team members who have worked with us for years, that was a, a very tough time, but that's where you just have to, to move the business forward and 
you get through it. So adding that pandemic resistant, again, not a label I wanted, but I think we've definitely proven that model out. So. And, and you should be proud of it too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of go back to the beginning though. What, uh, what makes Woofies really your business unique in an industry compared to others that are, that are non-franchised? I think first and foremost, having the blended service offering, you have the pet sitting dog walking side, and then you have the mobile pet spa, mobile grooming side and having those two lines of recurring services, um, I think is especially appealing for a franchise owner, but it also what makes us unique because we build that relationship with the client. So a client might come in because they need overnight care or some pet sitting visits or a midday dog walk when they go back to school or when they go back to work, um, or they might come in on the grooming side, but being able to offer those blended services, I think is what makes us very unique. But also I would say is really the heavy focus. And again, kind of the blend of professionalism, but that really high personal touch. And we saw that in the early days with our business. And there's a lot of people who are so wonderful that get into the business of, of the pet space, but it's a business. You really like, this is not a hobby. It's not a, a cute little dog walking job. This is somebody's home, somebody's pet. It's a lot of responsibilities. So having that high level of professionalism, but not being so corporate that you lose that highly, highly personal touch, because that is what makes, I think, Woofie special in the owners that we're bringing on as franchise owners. They get that. They have that business savvy, but they have that passion for what they're doing, that commitment to be part of the local community, because that's what gives you longevity in this industry. You've got to be very personal with your clients. You have to provide the exceptional service. You've got to be part of your community. All those different factors just contribute to having a long-term business. Yeah, Amy, that's a brilliant fine line that you just balanced right there by saying you want to have that professionalism yet have that personal touch. Because you don't want to yeah. come off too corporate. No, it doesn't work. Yeah, you can't it's come into somebody's work. house, you know, flying by the seat of your pants with no rules and no systems because then people don't feel comfortable like you have your act together. Right. And it's, I mean, anyone who has a pet can relate. Just when you go out of town, you want to make sure someone's coming over at 7 a.m. or when they're doing an overnight, they're taking care of your pets. They're not throwing a party or out right. <laughs> something yeah. they shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, it's it's truly just that responsibility and, and making and giving those customers that peace of mind. And that's really what we aim to have with our clients is that strong relationship, that personal connection to them and to the community, but also being that trusted resource for them so that they can go to work all day and know that their dog's getting walked or they can go out of town and go on that amazing Greece vacation and know that their pets are being very well taken care of. You're really in the peace of mind business, aren't you? We are. That's absolutely. That's ultimately what business you're really in. Well, yeah, I always say, obviously we did not create the concept of dog walking and pet sitting sure. and mobile grooming. There's lots of competitors out there. And I always tell the franchise owners, you know, we do a competitive analysis, you know, before we move into any market and really understand who's out there. But I always tell them, focus on you and your business and what you're doing and what makes Woofies unique. There's always going to be competitors, but providing that peace of mind to the customers and building that relationship and having that trusted name in the local community mm -hmm. is, is critical to be successful in this type of business. That's awesome. I want to go back to what you said earlier when we talked, starting to look in franchise, going looking into franchising. So you went to the IFE in New York. Mm -hmm. Was it there where you had the defining moment to franchise the concept, or had you decided already? I want to kind of understand when. When did you decide that you're going to franchise? What What happened to make the trigger that? I had been trying to educate myself about franchising and, and what that looks like. But I went to one of the seminars by Mark Siebert from iFranchise Group. Sure. And he still checks in with me to this day. He's, he's such great. an amazing guy. He um, We worked with this company um, in the very beginning when we first started franchising. They were such a huge help. And he's really been a mentor. But meeting him and then meeting so many other people who eventually became mentors as well for me and my team, it was just a no brainer for us at that point. We just knew that was the direction that we wanted to go in. So I think sitting through 
the seminar in New York and going through that first seminar of A to Z of franchising, mm-hmm. that's when I really kind of fell in love with the concept and it, it felt right for our brand. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, let's go over some of the numbers. So I understand you have 40 franchises open. Sweet. Even though you only franchised in since 2019, that's, that's incredible. Uh, you have five more in development. You're in about 20 states. One of the most popular questions I get from emerging founders is how do I find my first, you know, dozen franchisees? So Amy, where, where did you find your first dozen franchisees? So when we first started, this was in 2019, it was all organic. Um, they were our first three franchisees were people that knew us in the local market um, and clients as well, um, or wanted to become a client. So those were our first three that came on board in 2019. So in 2019, we brought on our first three franchisees. Tanya Lee was our founding franchisee in Reston. She wanted to become a client, but she was out of her territory and she was about to do it by herself. And then she heard that we were franchising. So she reached out to us and it was an immediate connection. We knew she was going to be our founding franchisee. And she has been the best brand ambassador I could ever possibly ask for. That's awesome. Amazing. Um, and then our next two franchise owners were clients of ours. So of course. they opened up their franchises. And then once COVID hit, we halted selling and awarding new franchises. We okay. really wanted to get through the pandemic, take care of our new franchise owners. We wanted to focus on our corporate location as well and just kind of get through all of that. And then we had started having discussions with authority brands. And in January, 2022 is when we became part of authority brands. And that's really where we have seen the increase in new owners coming on board because having this parent company now, we had the resources, the capital and the expertise behind us to really get out there and start marketing us as a franchisor and having the resources to be able to attract top owners that are now coming part of our system. So really it was once we became part of authority brands is where we Mm -hmm. saw the growth happen. Um, But I always caveat that because growth is great, but it has to be responsible growth. It has to be the right owners, the right situation in order to be a successful franchisor and have a successful franchise system. And that's something that was very important to us. We're not caught up in the numbers of, oh, we sold 500 franchises this year. Mm-hmm. It's not selling. It's not worrying about numbers. It's how do we bring on the best owners possible that are going to add value to the brand, that are going to promote the brand, be those great brand ambassadors like Tanya? How are they going to help us elevate our brand as a whole? And that's what we look for. So I always talk about responsible growth. That's something that's just very important to us and to authority brands. That's awesome. And, and I know, of course, responsible franchising is a big bud, buzzword throughout the IFA now, but it's it's mm-hmm. it's always been a thing to make sure that we franchise responsibly. That's nothing new about that. I think it's become maybe more of a buzzword because of the um, the the influence of, in you know, some cases, private equities push or the franchise sales organizations, you know, claiming, hey, we're going to sell 40, 50 franchises for you this year, whether you're ready or not, uh, and the broker group. So, uh, you know, and, and also uh, founders or leaders that are saying, I just want to keep franchising and, and opening locations. So it's, I think everybody's part of the uh, problem. Uh, I don't put any blame on any one one part of franchising, but it's definitely become, uh, it's more of a buzzword as we're all hearing, right? I think so. I mean, I think it's uh, it's just something that it's ever, it should be on top of mind. I mean, it's uh, you do want to grow the brand, but you really have a responsibility as a franchisor to be able to support your franchisees. And um, these are people that are, investing heavily into this new franchise system. And this is their, their world, their life. Absolutely. And you have such a strong responsibility to take care of them and provide all the support that they need. So it's something that I know so many people take that so seriously. And I just, and it is probably very overused and a little cliche, but I can't help it because it is very near and dear to my heart. Good. I think that's just Critical. That's awesome. So Amy, who is your ideal franchise owner and what traits do they need to be successful in running your brand? 
uh, kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You have to have that business acumen, that management experience. You're going to be managing a team of people, a lot of different personalities. You know, on the pet sitting side, you could have a 70 year old retiree and a 22 year old college kid and everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your groomers are very creative, artistic people with a highly specialized skills. So someone who has very strong management experience with all different age groups, someone who has just that very strong business acumen, who who understands and appreciates that this is a business and it's not just a hobby and a cute thing to do. I want to go play with puppies. So <laughs> that piece, uh, but also you have to have that passion for animals. Uh, this is not a business that you can go in effectively and just all business and all I care is the bottom line. And I don't care about the relationship with my team members or the relationship with my clients and taking care of the pets. If you don't have that piece, this is not the brand for you. Mm. It just, it's, it's, you can't just like animals. I, I think you have to have that, that true passion and your team has to reflect that as well. Yeah. Are you looking for single, strictly single unit franchise owners or doing multi-unit franchise uh, opportunities as well? We have a mix. Um, we have um, several locations that do three territories. That's kind of the max that mm -hmm. we would offer. A lot of ours are one and two territory owners. How big are the territories? They're based on households, 75,000 households. Okay. All right. That's, mm -hmm. a good, that's a good size territory. I'm wondering about the kind of the training and support and all this because there are you're spinning a lot of plates as a franchisee for your brand because right. there's so many different services that really might not really relate to one another. So can you elaborate a little bit on the training and support if I was a new franchise owner? Yeah. So when you first come on board as a new owner, you go through our onboarding process, which typically takes 45 to 60 days. Um, about 30, 45 days into it, you start pre-training and that's one month uh, online pre-training. It's two sessions a week. So for those people who are still going through all their onboarding, you know, kind of do the pre-training at the same time. And then we have you come in for one week of hands-on training at our Ashburn location. And that's really great where we work with the owners and they go out in the van with the groomer. They see what it's like, what a day in the life of a groomer is. Um, they go on consults. So they see what doing new client consults looks like. We have them go through pet tech first aid certification. Everything that we do is, is very hands on that week that uh, we have them come in for training. One thing that we started doing earlier this year, and I absolutely love it. Um, every month we have a meet your pack day where our candidates who are in the final stages, they come into Ashburn and do an in-person meeting with the operations and marketing team. And we coincide it with the week that we have the in-person training for our new owners. And it's really great because we'll do a happy hour or a dinner, but we have the new owners going through training. And then we have our candidates that are flying in to make, you know, meet with the team and go through the meet your pack day. And then we also invite our local Virginia franchise owners to come. And it really kind of goes to the culture of Woofies, very open transparency, very collaborative. We're an emerging brand. We love that collaboration among our owners. So it's been something that has been new this year and we absolutely love it. It really gives our candidates a great opportunity to spend a little time with these new owners and just, hey, what's it really like? How'd it go through onboarding? How's the training going? And these people, a lot of times, end up becoming like their mentors once they come on board. Oh, so it's been really fun to blend the candidates with the new owners. You're giving them a taste of the culture really early on. Very early. And you probably, Very early. you probably weed people out better by doing this, don't you? We do. We weed, but on the flip side, it really shows what the brand is all about. And they get to meet these awesome owners locally in Virginia. They get to meet these awesome new owners going through training mm -hmm. and they get to see what kind of people is, is going to comprise their new peer network. And right. I always talk about with emerging brands, like one of the, the biggest benefits of coming into an emerging brand, but just any franchise system is you now have this group of peers 
that you're all business owners together at Whoopies, and I want them to all meet early on and get to know each other and collaborate. So when you do have a question, you can pick up a phone to the owner in Rochester, New York. You can pick up a phone at, down in Greater Jacksonville, North Carolina, and these are people you might have already met, um, but we want that very collaborative spirit with our owners. That's awesome. Um, and one of the challenges, I, I know I face the same thing with my company being a service-based business, is trying to ensure consistency from location to location. So with Woofies, I would imagine you probably face the same challenge. H how do you try to in ensure that consistent experience, uh, no matter where a customer may be? I think it starts from day one, bringing on the right owners who really understand the brand and understand what makes it unique and understand what's kind of non-negotiable. And that number one to me, non-negotiable in this space is providing that exceptional customer service mm -hmm. um, because you you just have to in the mm -hmm. pet space. That's just, there's no other way to do it. So I think it, it starts from bringing on the right owners. Um, it starts when you come to the meet your pack day and we really emphasize like what this culture and what this brand is all about. And when you go through training, what we were just talking about, like going through that week long training and really understanding what needs to be consistent as a brand. Like when someone goes to a Whoopies in San Antonio versus a Whoopies in Walnut Creek, it's gotta be that same exceptional customer service. So that part, I think, is we're really trying to drill that in from the very beginning, from the very get-go of, mm -hmm. of what that culture is and how we can have that consistency. But I also recognize each market's a little different. And I know, I'm sure you, as in your experience also, you, you see that. And sure. each owner's a little bit different. Each owner has a, a little different personality, brings a little bit of a different flavor, which I love, to the business. But what works in Delray Beach is going to be different than what works in Kansas City or works in another territory. So you just ha also have to respect that piece of it too. That's that's great. I, I think uh, obviously we we live or die by how good our franchisees are, right? And and the right bringing on the right people. Is there a, a franchisee that uh, comes to mind? I know we we don't play favorites here, but is there a franchisee though that comes to mind for you that culturally is just sort of the you know, the, the template or the, the ideal culture fit that maybe even exceeded expectations and, and what do they do to achieve success? Well, don't roll your eyes at this answer, but there's a <laughs> lot that I would put in that bucket. That's honestly. great. No, that's awesome. Yeah. There are so many owners that honestly surprise me so much in such an amazing way. When I see what they're taking with their woofies and just taking it to this next level and a lot of it you can see even on social media. You can see the team that they're building and the customers and the engagement they have. You can see that on their social media pages and that joy and love of what they're doing comes through. And I am so proud every time I see that or every time I see them out doing a local event um, or just their excitement of bringing on new team members um, and just creating that culture and, and taking that love for what they do. It, it's just, I know I sound super corny and I'm, no, that's all good. We, we really have, we, we have really great franchise owners. I'm really proud. That's if I did anything right. It's you just have. bringing on these it, awesome owners. I, I'm, so. just, I'm curious because again, this is something that comes up from franchise founders from time to time. Is there anything that you do specifically to, um, in, in trying to find or recruit the right franchise owners to use any behavioral assessment tools or, you know, personality tests or anything for that matter that to help you uh, find the ideal person? Or is this just more instinct when you're interviewing candidates? Yeah, we don't do the behavioral tests. Um, we do have a really fantastic franchise development team that starts working, you know, with the candidates and they know our brand. They're such a, a huge part of our team and they really understand well, like what makes a good franchise owner for us. So it really starts from the very beginning with our franchise development team. And our operations team is very involved in the whole process. I mean, it's when someone's a candidate, they are meeting with me directly, the operations team, they meet marketing, they work with our franchise development team, and they come in for that meet your pack day, they meet our fellow owners. So we really spend a lot of time with these owners to really 
get to know like, is this the right business opportunity for you? And are we going to be good partners together? Um, because there could be a great person, but maybe this isn't the right brand. Or it could be somebody that maybe is a little too risk averse to have a business of their own, sure. right? There's, you know, yeah. sometimes you just see people like that, that, you know, their heart, they have the will and the heart and they have that passion for animals, but are they ready to own their own Whoopi's business? Um, and then we've got others that, are so entrepreneurial, they want to take over the brand. So it's right. awesome. Like you just have like a whole mix of people that come into your system. Yeah. And that again is a delicate balance between mm -hmm. having an entrepreneurial spirit yet following the systems and processes, right. following the rules right. of having you set up as your as your brand. And I'm I'm gonna to venture to say that now that you have 40 franchises that are open, it's going to look slightly different when you're at a hundred, because some of those folks that were risk averse at 20 or 30, when you go to 100, are going to say, Amy, I, I want in now. Right. That's hope. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> that's, that just seems what happens in franchising. Well, it's also the yeah. same reason why you have your first dozen franchisees. They were more, more risk takers, right? They were a little more entrepreneurial. Absolutely. That's just the nature of the beast. So, yeah, you, you, you'll see culturally, it'll, it'll start to shift in a bit. I, I could see that. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a fun part of an emerging brand is totally having these new owners come on board. And yes, we are a young brand, but you also have more of a say in an emerging brand. And I think that's an exciting part too. And that's why bringing on these new owners, it's so critical that we get the right owners coming in early on because they all are leaving a bit of a blueprint on our system as a whole. And I think that's pretty exciting. And they all have a, we're very collaborative. Like we make sure that everyone speaks up and has say and has some thoughts and some ideas. And we've had some owners come with just some tweaks on like marketing or a tweak on a service or something that is great because all it does is strengthen us as a whole, as a brand. So I, I like that part of the emerging brand. I think that's a lot of fun. I think it's the most exciting time period. And that's why I'm doing this mm -hmm. podcast I know. I love this time period. That. I love the time period of emerging. It's just fun. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's exhilarating. It's scary at times, but there's. <laughs> it's not boring. It's never boring. It's never boring. Never. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a special time. I think. Um, I always relate things back to clients, and I think of Ashburn. I think of those early days, and I always tell the story, literally on day one, Leslie and I walked one dog for $10. That is how we started. Sweet. And I remember it like it was yesterday, Cody and Lucky, sweetest dogs. And, and I remember that feeling, that excitement of working with these new customers. And every time a new customer came on board, how exciting it was. But I fast forward to 20 years, and you still feel that same love of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I really... I really want that for our franchisees as well. Whether we're at 40, whether we're at 100, it's really important. I know things will change a little bit. Obviously, it has to as you scale to that level. Sure. But having that relationship and that excitement anytime you have a new owner coming on board, I can't see ever losing that. Yeah. I just I can't. It's too personal. What about your role? How has your role changed since becoming part of Authority Brands? I wear many hats. Um, I would say my biggest responsibility is playing a role in bringing on new owners so mm -hmm. that we can grow the brand. Um, I'm always looking at key partnerships. Um, we have a national partnership with the Farmer's Dog. Um, we have a couple more that are coming out very soon. Um, another one was with Pet Vet Connection for 24-7 Vet Telehealth Services. Um, I, I think that's really important. Anything that we can do to help elevate the brand, help our owners be more successful, help our owners have more services and more value that they can provide for their clients. That is a role that I take very, very seriously. So that's a big piece of my role is working with the operations team, the marketing team. You know, how do we bring more incredible owners on board? How do we better support them? How do we have more resources? Technology is always changing, making sure we're staying up on that. Um, how do we make our owners more efficient, more profitable? Those are, as you know, having a franchise, I mean, there's just so many sure. different hats that you have to wear. Um, but at the end of the day, it is all about those franchisees. Uh, on the flip side, relating to your industry itself, 
Uh, are there any trends or anything you want to share? What's what's changing right now in in the pet industry? We're definitely seeing a bit of more of a crowded space. You're definitely seeing more competitors coming into the market. Okay. Um, even just from when I started franchising back in 2019, uh, we're definitely seeing some more people getting on the uh, the pet space train. So. Mm -hmm. Always keeping an eye on that. Uh, you can never get complacent. I think you always have to keep your brand very fresh. You have to stay very current of trends. Um, we were, and to this we still are, but I, I love that we are the first to be the first franchise system combining the pet sitting, dog walking, and mobile grooming. I think that is a trend that you do see in the pet space where it's based on that relationship. How else can you as the business owner provide more value for your clients? What other services can you provide for their pets because you have that established relationship? So I definitely see that as a trend that's continuing on in the pet space. Um, I think there are so many different directions you can ultimately go in because people love their pets. That's not going away. The mm -hmm. industry is growing exponentially and continues to. It's, it's not a fad. It's not something that you're gonna have a dip it is just pets are here to stay, thank goodness. And Absolutely. for us, it's how else do we provide more value to those pet parents? Okay. Um, what about for you? What's your long-term vision of the company? I would love to see Woofies all over the country, which we're, we're getting there. You are um, getting there. We are getting there. I want Woofies to be that premium pet services company. I want, I want to be that company that people want to come work for us. They want to build a career with us. And a lot of people don't know you can have a career in a pet space. They mm -hmm. just think, oh, it's just dog walking or grooming. You can have an incredible career in a pet space. And I want to attract those types of people who want to come and work for one of our Whoopies locations and love what they do and have a career path, whether you're starting as a pet sitter and you become a groomer or you come work in a back office or you become a general manager or you go open your own franchise. Um, I think there's so many opportunities. So I, I want us to be that company that people want to come work for. I want to be that company that business owners want to come build their own Woofies. Mm -hmm. And I want consumers want to use Woofies services because it's a trusted brand. It's a trusted name. And they know what they're going to get depend, regardless of what location that they're in. They know when they have Woofies, it's going to be that highly localized, personalized service. What do you think in terms of your business? Is there a, a, a challenge that your franchisees face that you that are unique and how do you help them overcome it? I think probably most businesses, if you were to ask that question, I would say labor. It's, I mean, I think that's universal. It's always people. Um, and especially with us on the grooming side, because it is such a specialized skill, mm -hmm. um, that is something that we've had our eye on from the very beginning. And actually when you look at, COVID, when we went through COVID, uh, we had just started franchising. We had a whole bunch of pet sitters that all of a sudden in those early months didn't have any work. And that's actually when we started our grooming school because there was such a demand for grooming and especially, mo especially mobile wow. grooming because we were able to stay open when the brick and mortars were not able to during COVID. And there was such a demand for grooming. I mean, think of every dog's a doodle mix these days and, and dogs need their ongoing grooming. And even if they're short hair like labs, they need those bath services and the nails trim and the ears clean and the teeth brush. So we really focused on building up a grooming school, which Tanya has now taken over in Ashburn, mm -hmm. which is fantastic, but building our own pool of groomers. So that's really what we're trying to do for our franchisees. And how do we scale that at a higher level? How do we create more groomers that are trained from the very beginning on not only how to be a great groomer and all the skills that you need, but to have the business acumen and the customer service skills, all the soft skills that are needed to be a really great groomer. And how do we scale that so that we can have more groomers coming into the Woofies franchise system? And that's that's the biggest thing, I think, is meeting the demand for groomers is cre helping create more groomers. And that's something that we're working closely with Tanya She's building up that grooming school in Ashburn, but mm -hmm. then how do we replicate that throughout the country? Because all of our franchisees need more groomers. Amy, you know what I'm hearing as you're talking is I'm hearing somebody who is actually raising the bar in the industry. 
Thank you. I That's exactly what you're saying. Because we, do, we really, we really want, I always talk about elevating the level of professionalism in the pet space. And that's, that's kind of my go-to saying, because that is what we're trying to do. This is not the little neighbor next door, right. you know, taking, and no, no disrespect to that, but this is a business and it's a professional business. And it also is an opportunity to create career paths for so many people. That's something that's very important to us as a brand. And and it is a a point for our franchisees. How do we scale our own local teams and have that grooming team so that we can meet the demand of the customers? Because people love mobile for grooming. I mean, if you can pull up to a client's driveway, it's one on one. You're not dropping them off at a salon all day. And it's that very personalized service. And there you go. I mean, it just, it, it's such convenience for the clients, Sure. Um, but we want to be able to meet that demand. Yeah. And you're, what you're ultimately going to do is your competition is either going to have to get better or they're going to get out. That's how the story is going to go. You know? Well, we do like our little tuck in strategies. Absolutely. I, like I think there's too. a lot of like opportunities it. for, you know, some of the maybe smaller companies, whether it's on the pet sitting side or grooming side, you know, kind of our, our value proposition to them is do what you love best, take care of the pets, but let us handle all the back end business side of it. So you can focus on what you love doing best, taking care of the pets, grooming the pets. Sure. Okay. There's one more thing you mentioned before the show that I, I thought was really unique is that as a co-founder, you went ahead and opened your own franchise location. I did. I did. So you get to experience the franchise through the eyes of a franchisee. Absolutely. And I love that. I always tell the franchise owners, there's nothing I'm going to ask you to do that I wouldn't do myself. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing I would ask them to do that I'm not. I mean, it's, it's just, and it's also great because I, I do, I think it's very important to have the same mindset of the owners and never lose sight of that. These are small business owners and I understand everything that they're going through because I went through it for 20 years with Leslie. I'm going through it again right. in Delray. Um, but also I love it as to putting my franchisor hat on. I love being able to test out different things in the Delray market. And if it's something that works really well, guess what? I'm going to take that to our franchisees and I can say, hey, I, I tried this system or I tried this technology or I tried mm -hmm. this marketing initiative let's rule it out. And if it doesn't work, it's on me and that's okay. But I love to have a testing ground as well for the franchisees. Yeah. That's the beauty of having, whether you want to call it a company owned location or a franchise location owned by a founder or a president is that we're not testing products and services directly on our franchisees as being Absolutely. the guinea pigs. We don't want to use their money to be the, Absolutely the testing not. ground. If we can, if we could avoid it at all costs. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's important. I want to be very respectful of their time, their money. And if something new that we're rolling out, if it's something that can help add more value for them, that's awesome. But I don't want them to be guinea pigs. Yeah. So since you've been franchising now for five years, what's been your biggest surprise? The biggest surprise? Um, I think the, the biggest surprise is working with these owners, how different in, in many ways everybody is and how unique. And you have some owners that just really surprise the heck out of you. And you know, I mean, you, you know, when they come on board that we each have that trust that, look, we have the same end goal in sight. We want them to sure. be successful. And we have that mutual goal that we're working towards. And it's just really fun when you see somebody either just shoot out and just do some really incredible stuff. It's kind of a surprise when they come up with something new too. Like, I love that. It, it's, it, it's just, it's, keeps you on your toes as a franchisor in such a great way. It's fun. Sure. Um, so I think how much we're enjoying it, not that I never thought we would, but the level of that and the relationships that you have with the owners, I feel like I have this whole new family. That's been a really, really wonderful blessing. That, so. That's that's wonderful. Well, um, it's amazing too, if when you're in an industry, as long as you have been, yet you still get surprised by ideas and innovation from other people. That's- um, I love that. Yeah. I love it. They're all just such really smart, interesting, passionate people. It sounds like so, they're really engaged in your brand. Yeah. They're all in. Yeah. 
It's yeah, not a job or career. They, they understand that this is, it's a lifestyle business. And there are some franchises where it's literally just a service you're providing. And there's others that it's like part of them. Like people, right. it, it's, it's part of their lifestyle. Absolutely. That's that, wonderful. This, what is definitely is that. Okay. Well, if someone was interested in learning more about the franchise opportunity, Amy, where would they go? Uh, they would go to ownawoofies.com. Okay. Awesome. Ownawoofies.com. <laughs> and um, all right. Well, I finish every franchise podcast by asking uh, a tip or trick. I call it the tip jar. So is there maybe um, something you would suggest if I was looking to franchise my company, what would be maybe a piece of advice that you would give me as an entrepreneur before I franchise my concept? Before you franchise your concept, mm -hmm. surround yourself with very good people. I am very fortunate. My operations team, we've all worked together for many, many years. And we are very tight. We know each other. We're very committed to working with each other. And I don't know if I could have franchised Woofies without having a very trusted, do you see a theme? Very yep. trusted uh, team in place. So I would say surround yourself with very good people, very smart people, people who get your culture your vision, your values, who share that. I, I think that is so incredibly important. That's great advice, Amy. I agree with you. We're only as good as our team, right? Exactly. Sweet. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. I appreciate you being on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning into the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. For additional insights, guest applications, and to stay connected, visit us at efbpodcast.com. The Emerging Franchise Brands podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and the views expressed do not necessarily represent those of Emerging Franchise Brands, its host Frank Fumi, or Emerging Franchise Group, LLC. Any discussed franchise or investment opportunity requires thorough investigation, obtaining proper disclosure documents, and expert consultation before making any investment decisions. The podcast and its host do not offer professional advice or endorsements, and they hold no responsibility for actions, representations, accuracy, or consequential damages related to the podcast content.